2 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm starting at verse 2 at that heading that says, Paul's joy over the church's repentance. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter, So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. I had boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you is true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. I am glad I can have complete confidence in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh, um, dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that we are not alone, that you, spend, you, you send your Spirit to be with us um, to accompany your word. Um, please give us uh, ears to hear and please transform our lives, we pray. Amen. Um, well, oh, what a great little uh, section this is. Um, We've, this is 2 Corinthians, and we know that Paul has had a lot of back and forth with the Corinthians, and he sent them a few letters, some uh, w- that we do have in the Bible and some that we don't. And Paul, in this section, acknowledges in verse 8, um, even if I caused you sorrow, um, he says, I see that my letter hurts you. Paul acknowledges that he sent these Corinthian people, this church, a letter, and as they read it, they felt hurt. They were hurt. And the words that is used is sorrow, or you could say uh, grief. They, they felt a grief. Um, and I, I wonder if that's a familiar feeling to you in your Christian life. Um, are you someone who has felt uh, in your Bible reading or in interaction with other Christians a feeling of sorrow about your own life, a feeling of uh, feeling hurt, 
even grieving your own sinfulness. Um, I've tried to think of some specific times um, that I felt like this, and I'm, I'm too ashamed to give specific details, but I, I do remember one time I, I was about 18, new Christian, and I was, on a, I was on a camp, and I remember it vividly, this feeling that myself and another Christian, we were in the toilets, washing our hands together, and having a chat as you look at each other in the mirror. And he mentioned something, uh, a, a way that I've been using my tongue, a crude, crude joking. And he made a comment like, do you know, is it, you've been using that phrase or word, is that, is that a good thing to, to say? And I just felt, ugh. I just felt hurt and, uh, and, and sorrowful about myself. Um, there have been other times in my life as well, you know, people saying, is that a, a good use of your time? Um, is your money, is that really yours? Or is it God's and you're, you're just holding on to it for a while? Um, in areas of, of sexual sin, what you think about, the way you treat members of the opposite sex. Um, it might be in Bible reading, you know, you, you come across something and it just gets you and cuts you to the heart and it, and it hurts. And it's a feeling of conviction of sin and sorrow. Um, now, uh, here's the wonderful thing about this passage is, when I feel like that, um, I can admit that my heart is complex and all sorts of things flood in and swirl around when I, when I have those feelings. But Paul gives us a really helpful way of sifting those and seeing them as something that is good. And he gets to the very heart of why those things hurt. Why do we feel sorrow and how do we understand our own hearts when we feel sorrow? Um, and what he does is he, he gives us two sort of phrases, and we can compare them. One is godly sorrow. There is a good kind of hurt that we can feel, that we can feel hurt in a godly way. There's also a worldly sorrow. There's a feeling of hurt and a sorrow that we feel that is, that is not good, um, that is not godly. Um, and just to let you know where we're going in, in We'll attack this in two parts. Part one, we'll just think about what is godly sorrow and what is worldly sorrow. And in part two, we'll think about, uh, and this is fascinating, how our relationships with one another will be transformed if we embrace godly sorrow. And in that little section, 8 to uh, 11, uh, we'll see what is, what is godly sorrow, what is worldly sorrow, and then the surrounding parts, Paul talks about his relationship with the Corinthians. Um, so first, let's think about um, worldly sorrow. Um, I'm going to read verses 8 to 10 again for us. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. So let's think about worldly sorrow first of all. And I think what that means is it's possible to feel sorrowful, sad, feelings of hurt about your own sin, but it doesn't go anywhere, and it doesn't help you in any way. Um, now, it's complicated. I think it's possible to feel those worldly sorrow kinds of feelings alongside godly sorrow, because we're all mixed bags, aren't we? But the danger is when we feel worldly sorrow in isolation, if we just have those without godly sorrow, um, it will lead to death. Um, I've got a couple examples. Uh, the first is, um, I feel embarrassed and ashamed at my sin. Maybe a Christian friend has uh, pointed something out in my life um, and they've, it's dawned on me that they've seen it there for a long time 
and maybe I haven't noticed or I've been pushing it down. And my only fault is, oh, I feel so embarrassed and I feel ashamed that people have been thinking of me in that way. And my motivation then to change is just to change what other people think about me. That is not godly sorrow. Um, <clears throat> yeah, another example might be um, self-pity. I feel really sorry for myself. Sin is often accompanied by suffering. Um, so an example to help us, if a, maybe if a man uh, cheats on his wife and she leaves him, he may end up in a very sad and sorrowful situation. It's worth saying, though, that often we're our own worst enemies, and Jesus is such a saviour that he even sympathises with us in our suffering that is self-made. But feeling sorry for ourselves alone is not godly sorrow and will only lead to death. Um, a quote from a, a, a Charles Hodge. He says, Sorrow in itself is not repentance. Neither is remorse, nor self-condemnation, nor self-loathing, nor external reformation. So, what is godly sorrow? Um, there is a kind of sorrow that is good and godly. Um, and verse 9b says, You became sorrowful as God intended. What a remarkable thought that God at times wants us to feel sorrowful at our sin. And it's part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sin and he intentionally causes us sorrow not because he likes hurting us but rather he has a better purpose for our lives and he wants to lead us to repentance and something better and in verse 9 we see that that uh, uh, paul brings this out doesn't he you know he says yet now i am happy not because you were made sorry he says i wasn't happy that you just felt sad and it should never be our intention to be happy to make someone feel sad but because your sorrow led you to repentance. I can see that your sadness was good because it led you to repentance. So I think four things we learn about godly sorrow. And um, the first is that the godly sorrow leads to repentance. And this is the big difference with worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is self-centered, focused mainly on our own feelings. Godly sorrow is God-focused. It's when a person's main concern is living to please God. Being reassured of the gospel and God's love towards them. Having a desire to be more like Jesus. Aware that in our sinfulness we can offend a holy God. And knowing that that is a bad thing. Not good for us and not good for God. So godly sorrow leads to repentance. It leads to changed life. Um, the second thing is, godly sorrow there in verse 8 only lasts a little while. What a great little phrase. Godly sorrow only lasts a little while. Because it if it comes with repentance, the sorrow will fade. Contrast that with worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow lasts your entire life. You can feel bad about sin your entire life. But if you repent and believe in the gospel and come back to Jesus and seek his help for change in repentance, it only lasts a little while. What a lovely thought. Um, here's another uh, wonderful one. Um, the third one, godly sorrow, in verse 9, it does not harm you. It hurts, but does not harm. Um, in the second part of verse 9, for you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Um, this is so helpful. So some opponents of, of Christianity might say that 
talk of sin and not pleasing God is just going to give people a guilt complex and it's going to cause terrible damage. It's going to harm people. But no, Paul says that godly, repent, godly sorrow that leads to repentance is not harmful, but actually it is good. It benefits you. It enables you to walk in a closer uh, way to God, and that is wonderful. Um, maybe this illustration works for you. Um, going for a run, it hurts, but it's not harming you. Physical training, it hurts, but it doesn't harm. In fact, it makes you stronger and more physically able. Maybe out of this, a good thing to do would be to pray that we would be sorrowful in a godly way, that we would experience godly sorrow. And what a wonderful thought that as we pray for that, that it's not harmful when we feel those things. Um, the, fourth, uh, the fourth thing is that godly sorrow produces fruitful repentance. Um, and in verse 11, Paul gives a list of, of wonderful things. He, he encourages the Corinthians, look at your lives. He says, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you. It, look at your own lives. It's worked in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to, to clear yourselves, what, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. You've been growing and growing in so many different ways, in your concern for people, in your um, concern for justice, um, in all these things. And I wonder if we did the same exercise um, look back in your life to, to earlier times in your Christian life. Um, maybe you've, you've felt a deep sorrow. Maybe through Bible reading or a gentle word from a friend or seeing a, a Christian live out, in a, live out the Christian faith in a different way and seeing the difference and knowing that something's not quite right with the way you're living. Maybe it's a feeling of a that you were displeasing God in your life and it hurt and maybe even at times drove you to tears. But in that sorrow, seeking God's forgiveness, asking him for help with repentance, your life has bit by bit being transformed into something more glorious. I can knowing the people that I know here, I can see that all the time, and it's wonderful. Um, we'll move on to part two, and that is that godly sorrow, if we embrace this as a community, uh, as, as church, it brings transformed relationships. Um, we see that in verses one to seven, um, when Paul talks about his uh, relationship with the Corinthians as well as, as, well as Titus, and in the, the section at the end. <coughs> um, so in verse four, uh, Paul says, I've spoken to you with great frankness. He's, he's told them what's true. He's told them what pleases God and what doesn't. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. Can you feel Paul's affection towards them? He speaks to them in love and he seeks to stir up godly sorrow in them as he, as he points out things that, that are wrong in the church and we've, we've covered lots of those things in previous weeks. He longs to see them grow in their faith and he knows that the greatest love that he can love them with is to love them in repentance and faith that their faith might grow and he risks causing them sorrow and hurt so that they might repent more and more. Now, if you compare that with worldly sorrow, if they respond with worldly sorrow, Paul is someone who just hurts them and makes them feel bad about their sin. That would leave the door open for other preachers who use flattery and impressive words to soothe their hearers, but stirs up no repentance in them. 
it would be easy for Paul to become the bad guy. And I think that's probably what was happening in the church in Corinth. <coughs> Rather, they responded with godly sorrow, and it transformed their relationship with Paul. Have a look in verse 7. And not only by his coming, that was Titus, also by the, by the comfort you had given him, he told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Can you see that wonderful relation, relationship dynamic between Paul and the church? Paul stirred up godly sorrow in them. The church received that as Paul's love for them. Um, through the gospel, they repented and they grew in their faith. And in return, they loved Paul and longed to see him because they knew that he would speak truth into their lives and they knew that his concern and love for them was genuine. And, and then that meant that Paul's joy grew. And he was all the more encouraged to minister to them. Um, we see a similar story with Titus. Um, he was greatly encouraged in, uh, in receiving this news. <coughs> um, in verse 15, and his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. And receiving Titus, it doesn't mean that they were fearful of Titus, it meant that they received him and his teaching um, uh, with a right reverence and fear and with trembling. Now the question for us is how do we grow in our godly sorrow? Wouldn't that be a great thing to grow in as Christians? And if I'm honest, um, when I'm convicted of sin, I think my greatest and, and quickest form of sorrow is usually worldly sorrow. Um, I think, who else knows about this? Um, I feel embarrassment and shame. Um, I think my other, my other quickest thought is just, I just don't like the feeling of sorrow. It hurts, and I want it to go away. And I find it it hard not to go to self-pity um, really quickly. But I, I think this is something to, to pray for and ask for God's help in. I keep coming back to Psalm 51. And David, in his conviction of sin, says, Against you and you only have I sinned. It's coming back to that idea of sin is offensive to our maker, the one who loves us and knows us. And also, um, I think verse 15 really helps us, that the people receive Titus with fear and trembling. When we really get a glimpse of, of knowing the glory of God and seeing him in all his holiness, and knowing the brightness of the light of Jesus that shines in the darkness. We see the, his light contrasted with the darkness of our own lives. And it's in that contrast that godly sorrow has room to, to grow. <coughs> and this fits with the flow of the gospel, doesn't it? That he loves to work in us bit by bit. Um, but what about our relationships with one another? Um, and I've got lots of questions about how we stir up godly sorrow in, in one another. It's worth thinking about, and maybe a good question to ask each other is, tell me examples, and I would love to hear this from you, tell me examples where people have done that really well in your life, Christian friends. Tell me examples where people have done that really badly in your life. Um, and I, I think a, a couple of little things that we can take from this. Um, my, my experience of it done badly is when it feels like someone has something that they want to get off their chest and they want to drop it on you and, and then leave it. And it's not open for discussion again. And that always leaves me in a place thinking, I don't really know what they meant. And it leaves me second-guessing. 
and I, I want to grow, but I'm not quite sure what the issue is. Um, better, the good examples for me have been uh, in pre-existing relationships where I, I know I'm loved. And I know where the person shares my desire to please God. I'm, I'm also really encouraged when people bring in scripture and they bring, it's a case of what is pleasing to God, not just what have I been offended by, but what is God offended by. I appreciate time to have a bit of back and forth where I can, um, where we can open the issue up and say, what about these circumstances? Would you say the same thing if you knew this, this, and this? And they might say, oh, okay, well, we'll we can narrow down on, on this bit. Um, I appreciate time knowing that my heart is, is complex and there's things going on and I want to, you know, help me draw those things out. Where, where really uh, is the issue? Um, uh, and what would help me, what would help me change? Don't just drop this on me and leave me, but help me out of it too. Um, let's, let's finish there and we'll pray. But please carry on that conversation. Um, and let me know good examples. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, um, oh, I think the big thing is we, we need your help. Please, please help us with this. Um, please put in us a desire to grow in faith and repentance, that we might welcome your spirit into our lives to shine light in the darkness, that we would welcome those thoughts that show us our sinfulness. And as you do that in us, Father, we pray that you would give us the strength to repent. Please don't leave us floundering on our own, but please come to our aid and rescue us. Amen.